All right, what did you think of those cute little children in that video clip? The only way it would have been cuter if our children would have been in the clip, right? <laughs> so I'm not that talented. I couldn't make that. But what those children shared are something very important for us as a church. I need you. Wasn't there honesty in those children's voices? Didn't you see that? Did you hear that? Honesty. What I love about the video is, again, honesty. The unashamed request for help. Unashamed request for help. The reminder and the reality that someday I will need you and you will need me. That I will need you and you will need me. Now, again, an honest Video we just saw, you know, Katie the other day came to me very honest, and she said, Daddy, are you pregnant? <laughs> I felt like I was pregnant when I put this on today, because it's been a year since I've worn this, but children are very honest, sometimes too honest. But again, the honesty in those children paint not only the reality that they need adults who will love and will invest in them, but that it's a humble duty we have to reflect Jesus to them and to others. Amen? Amen? It's a duty, a humble duty and responsibility that we have. Now let me ask you, what about us as adults? Did you relate with anything those children were saying? Sometimes I may think I'm smarter than I actually am. I've had those thoughts, and Sarah very kindly says, are you sure about that, honey? <laughs> Maybe I'm sharing a little too much. But uh, as adults... We, too, have those same concerns. Those same concerns. But as adults, we've also realized that sometimes it's not very safe to open up with our concerns. Here are a few that I've heard and I've felt many times before. The feelings of shame. Sometimes we don't open up because we feel ashamed. We fear that we'll be judged we fear that we'll be judged. We feel that we won't open up and we won't feel safe enough to open up. We feel overwhelmed with the feelings of failure, failure that you might have felt. Or how about the fear of being let down? The fear of not knowing where or who to turn for, for understanding or compassion. And the last one, feeling like they don't belong. What about you? Have you ever struggled with the feeling of being accepted and loved and safe enough to come as you are? This morning I want to dive into a pretty important picture that I believe Deuteronomy 19 will help uh, facilitate for us. And as this picture begins to emerge of how we and where we can find some of those very same things. Now children, just as you're looking at Deuteronomy 19, I've put together one of these sheets for the children. It's got some fill in the blank, and, uh, and if you need one, I think there's some more. But I want you to follow along as, we kinda ch as I kind of share with you some thoughts. This way you can get involved, fill in the blanks. Um, but I want you to listen for one word throughout this talk. I'm not going to tell you how many times I'll say it, but it's the word refuge. Okay, so children, as you're filling that out, I want you to keep count of how many times we talk about refuge, okay? So Deuteronomy 19, 1 says this, When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, verse 2, thou shalt separate Three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now we see something really special happening here. As Israel is shifting its focus from the wilderness to Canaan, the promised land, Moses is establishing an infrastructure for justice. And he's calling for how many cities? Three. Three cities of refuge. All right, there's a hint. That's one, refuge, okay? 
So he's calling for this justice system where three cities of refuge can be established. And what they're being set up for is this, verse 4. And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither that, ha- may have, that may, he may live, who killed his neighbor accidentally or ignorantly, whom he had hated not in the past. As when a man goeth into the woods with his neighbor to cut wood, and his hand hatch stroke with the axe to cut off the tree, and the head slipped off of the axe and hit his neighbor and killed him, and he died, he shall flee then to one of those cities and live. So see what's happening here is Moses is setting up these cities of refuge. So if there is something that somebody's done accidentally, it's a safe place, a refuge for them to go and hide. Because individuals who have accidentally killed another, people could run to you from vengeful family members and seek refuge, find security, shelter, and community. All right, let's skip. So, here are three important parts to the city of refuge concept. First, he ordered that roads be built to those cities, 193. So those on the run would have an easier time getting to those places. Not only is the road supposed to be better, but they said we need to put signs that show people how to get to that city of refuge. All the roads, again, leading to the city of refuge have to be straight, level, and always kept clear and good repair. So second, the locations of the three cities were strategically placed, strategically placed, not placed on where the money of those locations, the most money is. No, it's strategically placed in specific areas into the three regions. This ensured that no one would have to travel a great distance to find rest and security. The cities of refuge were all upon the level plain or in valleys in well-known areas. They were at convenient distances from one another for the benefit of all the tribes. And lastly, when Moses was setting this up, Deuteronomy 19, Moses made plans for the increasing number of cities of refuge from three to six to match the expanding territories given by God. Because the existence of safe cities was so important, provisions had to be made for future adaptations so that the population would continue to have access to the desired benefits. The cities of refuge must be where the people were, not simply where tradition had originally placed them. Now, Moses further confirmed this plan by also designating six six of the Levites' 48 towns as cities of refuge, three on each side of the Jordan River. Among other considerations, he instructed that those cities were to be inclusive. They were for Israelites, aliens, and temporary residents. One significant benefit as we wrap up this concept of cities of refuge was to belong to the priests. These cities belong to the priests was that these socio socio refugees could receive training from the religious leaders. Hence, the place of refuge could become a source of real blessing to the slayers as priests and Levites taught them. A real blessing. When I joined the army in, in 2008, that was a completely new concept for me. Completely new. No one in my family had ever been in a force before. Um, and being from Canada, when I told my family I was joining the United States Army, they said, what? But that's only because I called the Canadian recruiter and they never called me back. <laughs> Go figure. Go figure. So I joined the United States Army and here I found myself at, at uh, training where I felt completely alone. 
And what was crazy about that is we all looked the same. We all wore the same uniform. But yet I still felt alone. They pushed us. They trained us. We failed. We got up. And as we continued to train, we started to realize that together we could accomplish great things. We could not only trust each other, but we could also trust our equipment. And this came really true when they started telling us that we were going to get gassed. I don't know if you, that was a weird concept for me. But they had us wear these pouches on our hips. And they would just out of the blue say, gas, gas, gas. And we had 10 seconds to pull that pouch out with our eyes closed, holding our breath, putting that thing on our face. 10 seconds. And so they trained us, they trained us, they trained us, and we got it down. 10 seconds, no problem. Until the morning came when they said, now you're all going into this room. And so they rushed us into this room, and we had our masks on, and everything exposed started to burn. But we could breathe. We could breathe. We realized that we could trust the person to our right, person to our left, and we can trust this apparatus on our mouth. Well, then the drill sergeants thought it would be funny if they came by and ripped them off our face. And so then we experienced full force, this gas experience. <clears throat> And, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to hold my breath. It's not going to be that bad. Till they started yelling, what's your social? And I'm like, oh, my social. And I'm like, I think I know it. And so I start to blab it out. And I realize that I'm using up the oxygen that I had in my lungs. And then the dreadful moment hits when you realize I have to breathe. And I took a big, <gasps> and the moment I felt that gas go into my lungs, I thought, oh, man, this is scary. The guy to my left, the guy to my right fell to their knees. I'm like, are we dying? You know, those thoughts come into your mind. Until finally, the doors open wide, and you're able to run out of that room. But before you do that, they have you put it back on so that you know how to trust that equipment again. I had a video I was going to show you, but it was kind of graphic, because as we ran out of that room, that building, they have you flap your arms like this. And uh, it's to get your oxygen going back in. And so all of us coming out of there looked like we were trying to fly. <laughs> and not only that, but there was a lot of stuff coming from different parts of our nose and crying. And so you run out of that building. But the point is this. The Army taught me a lot. A lot. And as I've met with soldiers and have counseled with soldiers, I've realized there are four main reasons why people join our forces and none of them are in order, and none are more important. But the first one I come into is heritage. People join our forces because their great-grandfather served, their grandfather, their father before them. And it's common to carry on that legacy and serve their country. So heritage. The second one is um, patriotism. Especially after 9-11, recruiters had no problem recruiting after 9-11. They were turning people away. You know, because there were so many people that wanted to serve their country for patriotism, to keep our freedoms. The other one is probably a big one for a lot of college students, and that's the financial aspect. Okay, the financial aspect that comes along with serving. And probably the most, I'm not going to say again important, but the biggest one I find when I talk to young soldiers who are struggling, they join because they want to belong. They want to belong to something bigger than them. They want to feel like they belong to something. And again, none of those are more important than the other. But what I do fear is the realization that our forces shouldn't be the place where they necessarily only feel like they belong. But it should be the church where they feel like they belong where they belong. Again, it's not bad feeling like you belong because there is a camaraderie in those forces. There is trust. There are all those things, and those are important. But as a church, this is where we belong together. Now, today's message, as I transition from cities of refuge to a church of refuge, I'm not implying for one second that this church is not a church of refuge. 
I hope that if you, as you have started worshiping here and have been a member forever, I'm new and I have experienced love here. I have experienced acceptance. I've experienced family. So not for a second am I saying that this is not a church of refuge or it hasn't been. I'm challenging us to continue being a church of refuge. A place where people can come into our doors feeling loved like I have felt. Okay? So, in keeping with this idea, I want to just show you uh, one example of how we can continue being a church of refuge, and that's found in John 8. So if you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to John 8. This models for us, I believe, some powerful truths that we can continue remembering as we seek to be a church of refuge. John chapter 8, verse 1. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Okay, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him. Where was Jesus? In the temple, in the church. Where were people coming to encounter Jesus? In the temple. And he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had sat her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he didn't hear so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone first. And again he stooped down and began to continued to write on the ground. Then those who heard, being convicted of their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst when Jesus had raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no man condemned you? She said, No, one Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't know what it would have been like to be in that presence, but I can know for a fact that at the feet of Jesus, there was forgiveness. There was acceptance. And so as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus as a church of refuge, we too will have that same things happening in our lives as we look to Jesus. Desire of Ages puts it like this. In his act of pardoning this woman and encouraging her to live a better life, the character of Jesus shines forth in the beauty of perfect righteousness. While he does not condone her sin, nor lessens the sense of guilt that she must have felt, he seeks not to condemn, but to save. The world had for its er this erring woman only contempt and scorn. But Jesus spoke words of comfort and hope. The sinless one pities the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisees denounce, Jesus bids her, go and sin no more. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censure, quick to discern shame, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in a path of holiness, and to stay his feet therein. Desire of Ages 462. So church, it's in following Jesus' example and the tradition, I believe, that we see in the cities of refuge. I believe and I pray that we will continue to be a church 
of refuge, where we are inclusive, accepting, community-oriented, strategically placed, safe spiritual environment for all. A faith community that accepts people for who they are, where they are. That is, friendship and acceptance are not given or withheld due to personal history, our appearance, current beliefs, or any other factor. As members of a church of refuge, we seek never to disrespect or exclude because of the mistakes or the questions that we may have. In these communities designed to meet needs, all can seek God and grow in Him. Now, while the Jewish cities of refuge were a, uh, a, a sanctuary type and thus a type of Christ, I believe that a church of refuge is also a modern spiritual sanctuary where people are again free to grow and thrive in Christ because there they will find safety, belonging, and acceptance. I share with you briefly in my testimony one Sabbath about a nine-month journey I had where I felt utterly alone. I would go to church, but it was such a huge church that every Sabbath I entered the doors, I felt like a visitor. And they would ask me, oh, where are you visiting from? The church was so big, and it's not, not, I'm not knocking big churches. Because when they're big churches, a lot can happen. There's a lot of support for, for church members in big churches. But this church was so big that I would go, and they would always say, well, welcome. We're so glad you're visiting. And I had been attending there for almost two years. <laughs> I guess I didn't stand out very much. You know. So for those nine months, I remember feeling utterly alone not knowing who I could turn to. I was unemployed. As you know, if you remember to my testimony, I had a beautiful baby on the way, Addie. She was not here yet. Katie was two. Sarah was working a part-time job. And I tried and tried to find a job to provide for my family. Well, one Sunday, I went to my unit, and the chaplain there, I was, I was a co-chaplain of this unit, and he was a mentor and he went to me and said, Matt, there's something wrong, isn't there? I said, yeah, how can you tell? He's like, you're not yourself. And so as he sat me down, he's like, what's going on? I said, well, you know, Ron, I'm so desperate to provide for my family. I said, you have a Tundra truck. I have a Tundra. And I said, I have a cap on the back of that truck. And in Michigan, you need a cap. Because when it's winter, the snow will fill that bed of that truck and you can't keep anything in it. So I said, I will sell you this. I'm that desperate. I love this cap on my truck, but I will sell it to you for whatever you want. And he said, well, I do want a cap. And so he said, so let me go home and talk to my wife, Lisa, and we'll see what we can do. Next day, I came back to the unit. He handed me a check. And I said, wow, okay. I said, I really didn't think about how much. He's like, well, I just wrote down a number. I said, okay. And he said, and besides that, he said, I don't want your cap. What? He's like, yeah. He's like, this is not to buy your cap. He said, I want to buy your cap when you really want to sell it, not because you have to sell it. And as I opened up that check, it was around this time of year. I think, right, honey? This time of year. I opened that check. It was for $1,000. $1,000. If you want to see a grown man cry, I cried. And he looked at me and he said, you know, this is no strings attached. You are a brother of mine. And he said, and I love you. I am proud of you and I believe in you. Now take care of your family. I was humbled. I was humbled. That changed my life. That changed my life. In a time when I was struggling to find out who I belonged to, where I could fit in, Ron taught me a valuable lesson. As believers, we belong. And I pray that this will continue to be a church of refuge. Psalms 46.1 puts it like this. Psalms 46.1.
Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Where was Mary taken? Where was Mary taken? At the feet of Jesus, right? Again, he was in the temple. I pray that when people come here, when they feel guilty, alone, ashamed, I pray that when they walk into this church, they will know they were in a church of refuge. Again, where they are loved, accepted. Where we can hold each other up and accountable, but where we can continue to show not only our children, look, we started, but each other, a loving God. Again, as we seek God ultimately for our refuge, may we also continue to find acceptance, love, support as a church of refuge as we continue to humble ourselves before God. God, we thank you for an opportunity to be a loving church and be part of it. We're grateful, God, that you are our refuge. May you provide peace and safety. And may we know without a shadow of a doubt that we are loved today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.